Hi, everyone. Welcome to our weekly American Musar gathering. Uh, this week, we will, will be our first of two weeks studying the soul trait of equanimity, uh, which is the ability to kind of stay centered no matter what is going on in the world. Um, I've told this story before, but I will tell you again that when I first started studying Musar in my first couple of months, I, you know, got this book and I'm like, let me go right to the equanimity chapter because that's what I need. And I had no idea what it was talking about. It really took learning all of these other practices and just getting familiar with the with the vocabulary so I could even uh, kind of approach this because there's so many other factors that cause us to kind of lose our center. You know, it's like when you're really upset, the last thing you need is somebody saying, calm down already. You know, that doesn't help at all. So um, what does help, though, is meditation. And so we will begin, as we always do, with a short meditation. So please relax and close your eyes. And take in a deep breath through the nose and hold. Okay. And hold. And inhale through the nose and hold. And exhale through the mouth and hold. And as thoughts come into your head, just observe them and let them pass. Like watching a car pass by on the road. Now is not the time for solving problems. Right now, all you need to do is inhale through the nose and hold, and exhale through the mouth and hold. And on your next inhale, say to yourself, Shema. And on the exhale, listen. Shema. Listen. In Shema, we're listening deeply, without judgment, without offering advice. In Shema, we're listening with an open heart. Shema, listen. And when you are ready, you may open your eyes. Hey, Christo, welcome. I love the uh, love your uh, little graphic there. That's really funny. Um, hey, Carrie, welcome. Stephanie, nice to see you. And uh, this is Lila. Say hello to everybody, Lila. So she's very rambunctious. She's probably hungry. I don't quite know what her story is, but I still, I still endeavor to keep my equanimity while this cat is trying to distract me. Okay, so for our starting point, we will look at these words from Rabbi Menachem Mendon Levin, which is the from the book Heshbon HaNefesh. And this is the book I was talking to you about before where I said, okay, I'm gonna go right to equanimity. And, you know, reading Rise Above the Good and the Bad for they are not worth disturbing your equanimity. That just didn't mean anything to me. It was really hard for me to kind of even understand where he was coming from. Now I've learned a couple of things since then. Um, we've been doing Musar together, so you might be as, um, as puzzled as I was, or you might, um, you might kind of have some ideas, but I'd like to know what you think. What do you think of this idea? What is, uh, what is he talking about? Rise above the good and the bad. Since we're 
I, if there's somebody who has the, their audio on all this time and I'm hearing some background noise, like a radio or something like that, if they could just. Great, thank you. Okay. Could you put that prompt, that reading up again? I I missed it. I was completely distracted. <laughs> Sorry. Sure, not a problem. Rise above the good and the bad. They are not disturbing your equanimity. Karen. So I'm thinking that rising above the good and the bad takes away bias, which leaves us somewhat balanced. Thoughts? Can you say more what you mean by like taking away balance? Or I'm giving if, more balance, I mean? If we rise above what's evil and what's good, we're not, um, we're not really falling to one side or the other. Hmm. I think we can be a little to one side sometimes and a little to another. But overall, if we don't rise above the negative and we get stuck there, mm -hmm. then our lives can be very much out of balance. And if we only revel with the joy, it may be difficult to recognize or experience um, when there's not joy and there are both. And so to have balance, we need to be somewhere near the middle and you can't really go beneath it. For a visual for me, I would see that as under the water and just being stuck in a mix of turbulence. But if you rise above, you have better clarity. You can see where the evil is, where the good is, where the struggle is, and better be able to determine where you want to be. I think it provides more clarity to be able to look down from the top. Love it, Karen, thank you. Let's hear for some more people. Paul. Yeah, um, so I think the way I think of it is that the good and the bad requires me to make a judgment call on something mm -hmm. instead of simply accepting something as being, as being that, that it's mm -hmm. something that exists. So if, if I'm not trying to label things as being either, I think that's relevant, you know, related to what Karen was just saying. If it's, if I'm not trying to label something as being either good or bad, and mm -hmm. I'm simply considering whatever it is, then uh, that gives me a sense of um, calm about it. Yeah, avoiding labeling to get calm. I love it. Thank you, Ron. Ron, I think I met your Hevruta by email this week. We had a nice exchange. I think the idea of rising above the good and the bad is being able to, in the middle of turmoil, being able to separate yourself. It's, it's visually, it is rising above the good and the bad so that you can look at what's going on like everybody else said, without putting a judgment on it, without being part of it, being separate from it. It's separating yourself from the rest of it, emotionally, specifically. Yeah, so you bring in a new concept, emotional separation. Thank you. Marjorie. Okay, there we go. Um, I see it as for me, it is going to be a centering point. I'm in the middle. If I go too far to the bad, it's very detrimental. Um, I look at too far to the good as being almost self-righteous. Mm. You know, people that are always, you know, they're always good. They're always right. It's like, but for me, it's my starting point and Kind of see, you know, I'll only go too far to either side and then pull myself back in. Yeah, so even on the good side, we can go too far. It can pull us off center. 
Terry. Um, what came to my mind is uh, the role of a mediator or the characteristics of a mediator, someone who is not on either side and can look at the whole situation, hopefully with some clarity and, and sort things out. So I think that's what we should try to do in with this particular sentence. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Love that. Karen. Sometimes I ask myself if I'm too close to a particular situation to be objective. And so I think here that if you rise above, you have more ability to be objective, which goes back to the clarity. Um, maybe someone else has experienced someone saying to them, you may be too close to this situation to um, you know, really be able to help or be objective, or maybe we need to pull back a little bit for distance. We've talked about that too. And so I think all of that relates to being above is that it gives us perspective. It gives us distance to have perspective. I think perspective is such a powerful word. And I think a lot of practicing equanimity is noticing when we start to lose perspective and figuring out what are the things that cause us to lose perspective. Because it's so easy to say like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm working on this. Yeah, I'll just keep, just keep your perspective and you'll be fine. Well, that's, that's really easy to say. That's pretty much impossible to do. So, so how do we, uh, come a little closer to, to being able to be in that place where we keep our equanimity all the time. Wendy. Sorry. Oh, I just thought, I, I just had a thought if, if uh, we're able to bring ourselves to a, a place of strength in equanimity, um, then um, equanimity will act as a window for us into identifying our strengths and other traits that we can rely, rely on to react to a certain situation. Could you explain that a little bit more, what you mean by strength and equanimity? Sure. Um, I used it actually when I had a job interview and um, there, there was a good and bad thing going on with this job interview. And I had a lot of different um, emotions and things coming at me at one time. In, I was doing a terrible job at this job interview. Mm -hmm. And I thought about Musar and I thought about equanimity and, and the, I had, it was a panel job interview and they hadn't asked me what my strengths and weaknesses were, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so in the end they said, was there something else that you wanted to say? And I just told them, um, well, you didn't ask me about my strengths and weaknesses, but I think one of my strengths is equanimity. Mm -hmm. And by that, I meant that if I was if I was kind of dwelling in a in a balanced place with equanimity, then all of the other strengths that I had in the various traits would would come I could tap into because I was at, at a place of calmness, at a place of balance. And and it's like sometimes if you're off balance, you might have a strength that you could rely on that you don't think of because you're, it's blocking you. There's mm. a block there. That's what, kind of what I meant. But I think they were impressed with equanimity because mm. I did get like it, It's not a paid job, but I still, I still thought it was funny to use that. Great example. Thank you, Wendy. You know, and listening to everybody talk and kind of what we experienced, I'm reminded of something that happened about a month ago and some of you were here and you may remember the email where when we were practicing order, um, there was a Zoom change. So the link from Judaism Unbound wasn't working anymore. And so I had to kind of scramble at the last minute and I'd done some preparation mentally about when to shift over. And so it was, it was an interesting moment that the order and planning is what came, it was what came up when we had this, this sort of chaotic situation that arose and everybody made it here within five minutes of the normal time. 
But we had a little bit of a situation arise today where somebody wasn't muted and we've all been there where we forgot to mute. And I'm just wondering, uh, did anybody lose their equanimity from that? And, oh, I can't hear. Um, wait, what's going on? Why isn't this person muting? What's the matter with them? Um, yes, Wendy. I mean, no, I was just rubbing my eye, sorry. Oh, okay, your hand was still up. I will put it down. Christelle. So I always try to be understanding and I was just thinking, yeah, the, the background noise and someone else's mic was frustrating, but you know what? I was like, Christo, relax. They probably, they obviously have no idea it's happening. If they knew they would stop it. Like if I've got background noise, I may not know it because I've got a little bit of hearing loss. I just make sure on the bottom left corner that the red lines through my microphone. And as a joke goes at my shul here in Lubbock, if you tell Chris to watch his language, we'll say, oh, sure. Which one? <laughs> so let me put mute back on my microphone and continue listening to the rest of you. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Marjorie. Um, it was annoying for a second. And then I just knew. So, you know, you go. So I go to that. I start seeing myself like, okay, turn it off. But I knew that it was going to be resolved. And in the big picture, it is such minutia. And that's the other part for me about equanimity is I have to evaluate, you know, what is the big deal? You know, just stay, you know, it, it's all going to get resolved, especially if it's just, as they say, first world issues, you know, mm. I have to, there's, there's where silence comes in. Cause so often I hear people fetching, which means complaining if, you don't know that Yiddish term. And uh, I just want to say, you know what? We're not, I always go to, unfortunately, Ukraine. I said, we're not being bombed, you know, when I see what's really important. So that really also helps me to stay, just stay centered. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Thank you. Paul and then Sarah. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. Um, so I, I can get irritated by the smallest thing, whether it's somebody who is um, going too slow, like when they're driving and clearly there's a big spot on the interstate. I'm, I'm in California now, right now. So being on, on freeways is like, an, you know, I'm back in the freeway mode of mm -hmm. travel. And, uh, you know, and so it's a matter of just remembering that um, in this case that, yeah, I mean, it's irritating. It's hard to see, hard to hear, but uh, as Christo said, you know, oftentimes things happen. I'm not aware of it. And then I'm not a bad person for not knowing it. Just and just like whoever had the the sound on, um, you know, they didn't realize it. So it's not good. It's not bad. And the equanimity for me is being OK about speaking up about it, but not speaking up like, you know, who is the, you know, expletive who left their microphone open? You know, that to me is not being equanim, you know, equanimity is being able to approach something, make a, even calling it out, but doing it in a way which is respectful to the process and not trying to bring in emotional baggage with it. Yeah, I think that's a really good description because it's not like, and there's a, a quote that we'll look at later. It's not like we're supposed to, it's not, it's not like being calm no matter what. You know, there are going to be things that happen. And it's embarrassing. I mean, if I had to list every trivial thing, which kind of set me off a little bit, it would be, you know, it's just ridiculous. I think we all get sort of have those things. And so it doesn't mean, well, I'm not going to say anything. Sometimes we could just say, you know, and it's like, yeah, it's like, oh, hey, by the way, I think somebody's unmuted. You probably don't know, you know, which is really different than as you, you know, said, how am I supposed to hear anything and concentrate and work on my equanimity if there's all this background in for me, a background noise? You know? So, Sarah. Well, you know, I heard the background noise and it didn't annoy me. I just was focusing on what the noise was. 
and I couldn't focus on what was on the screen. Mm -hmm. And um, so I didn't get annoyed about it. I just noticed that, it, you know, it was just sort of interfering with my concentration. And so it was like, no judgment, but just I was aware. Yeah. And that's not to say at all that I don't need to practice equanimity in many other areas. But in this instance, I it didn't ruffle my feathers. It was just sort of I noticed it and I didn't say what a jerk or whatever. You know, it, I didn't judge it. I just noticed it. Mm -hmm. Noticing is good. Thank you, Sarah. Krista. This is one big reason why I changed my Zoom settings a few months ago to where no matter what Zoom meeting I go into, I want it, my mic to be muted no matter what. Mm -hmm. Just just out of respect for other people in the group, because there have been times I did not know my microphone was on. And I had to put, I had to decide which foot am I going to put back in my mouth this time, because I realized everyone in the whole Zoom meeting, it was over 200 people heard something I said. I'm like, okay, Christo, go pay off your grave, grave plot because you need to live there now. Mm bad choice of words, but yeah. just my way of trying to be mindful of other people in different Zoom meetings, I just changed my settings by default to keep myself muted when I'm in, when I join. Right. It's an interesting example of how we practice one soul trait, you know, practicing order. It's like, okay, I'm just going to plan ahead and I'm going to change my default settings. So, you know, this doesn't happen because I kind of embarrass myself. Um, and that's also, um, you know, we're getting closer to the high holiday season. We're getting closer to what we talked about, this Alul workshop. Alul is the month before the high holidays where it's traditional to kind of start your teshuva process, to start your repentance process. And one uh, definition of teshuva, of change, is being in the same situation again and acting differently. Um, my wife and I had something where we messed up the calendar for this week, where we missed something. And then we just figured out that we missed something for next week and double scheduled. And they're like, okay, you know, we can't miss another thing in this summer. So we just dropped whatever we were doing and we sat down and we went through our calendar. And to me, that felt like teshuva, where if you keep like, messing up your schedule and it's impacting other people then that's on us to make sure that we're that we're communicating and dealing with things correctly um and also it's that's also another way of keeping equanimity where we didn't have to kind of have a little but we talked about doing this and well it wasn't on the calendar in the way i could see it so anyway that's um without getting myself in trouble um let's go a little bit deeper a fantastic conversation just on this this first one so could someone uh read please unmute and read the uh the mantra for equanimity better to surf the waves of life than get pounded or swept away great thank you wendy yeah so um how does that kind of relate to what we've been what we've been talking about? You want me to copy that in the chat? Would that be helpful? Yeah, okay. There we go. Sorry, who's that on iPhone 5? I'd just like to know who's here. You're unmuted. Who who are you? iPhone 5.
Okay. Sorry for whoever that was, but I'm okay with people having their cameras off, but if there's not a name, if there's not somebody that we know, then I'll let them back in in a sec. So Wendy. Oh, um, having lived at the beach most of my life and surfing on and off, but also families of surfers, uh, surfing takes a lot of focus and a lot of preparation and a lot of, um, uh, you have to look at the paper, you have to keep up on the, the surf news. And, and then of course, I loved the fact that I got to watch the US open at surfing almost every year. So it was so different. But what you see are people who know what they're doing and have taken the time to, to study and not just walk in oblivious to anything. And then on the other side of those surfers were people coming from other cities who had not really been to the beach much. And invariably the lifeguards, of course, they had their, their jobs because it would be a warm day and they would come and they look and it's, they say this every time, it's just water. Mm -hmm. I like thinking of glass of water, you know, and, and they're just not prepared. So that being one of the things that you can do so that life does not pound you and, and sweep you away is to get prepared. Mm. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, important shout out for preparedness, just understanding, you know, what, what you're dealing with. Other observations? You know, one of the things that's meaningful to me about this is that, you know, life does have waves. You know, again, sometimes they're big, huge waves. You get the monster wave that nobody saw coming. And, you know, it really is just incredibly painful and disruptive. And sometimes they're kind of minor waves that are things that happen routinely. And as we were just talking about, sometimes those can be a little bit disruptive too, but you don't want to you don't want to let yourself get sort of ground into the sand or you don't want to get so like caught up in the, you know, excitement that you just sort of, um, you know, uh, I'm going to go on a crusade, you know, to get everybody to automatically mute themselves before they come into a meeting and it's going to make the world a better place. I mean, that's a little, you know, That'd be a little bit too much in the other other direction. Thought I saw some other hands. Wendy, is that a new hand or is that your old hand? They carry, okay. Uh, one thing that came to mind is if you don't surf the waves, then you uh, put yourself in a position of being uh, becoming a victim or um, not having some semblance of control over your life mm -hmm. and just if you, I mean I don't know, know how anybody could not do something but but apparently there are people who can do that um, and then you're just left to whatever happens and that's just not mm -hmm. a happy way to live so thank you Carrie Paul and then Marjorie. Yeah. Um, so, as I think most of you, maybe not everybody knows, but um, so I've been, uh, I was laid off uh, the very first of June. And uh, so I'm still looking for work. And um, I realize there's a lot of things that are happening in the world of tech that have nothing to do with with me, so it makes it a bit more difficult. Plus, as I've been reminded by recruiters, uh, July going into August is a very slow time for anybody, and I've known that. You know, people go on vacation, hiring managers go on vacation, so they, no no hiring happens. So uh, being 
being able to have a sense of equanimity where I'm not simply tossing in the towel, essentially saying, well, I'm not going to do anything because what's the point, uh, but also not getting so anxious about it. And um, so I guess these are the two poles, right? You know, oblivious to whatever's going on or just getting hysterical about it, but finding the way to stay engaged in a way that's useful where, um, you know, I'm not becoming, uh, you know, emotionally, not creating emotional turmoil within myself um, and uh, and being able to be present for, you know, I'm out with my mom now uh, or, you know, for this being at home, being with my, with Carrie, with my grandkids and just finding a way of balancing things out is difficult because, you know, with work, honestly, I tend to be a bit of a workaholic. So it's like, well, the more time I spend with that, that's easy, you know, mm. but uh, I'm learning to that, that I can't do that. I can't be looking for work 24 seven or even eight hours a day. It's just exhausting. Mm -hmm. So finding a way to have equanimity in this process is uh, a major challenge for me. And, uh, but it's useful. I mean, I, I am finding uh, the, a, a lot of um, clarity about dysfunctional things that I've done in the past. So thank you, Paul. Yeah. Okay, well, let's start moving. To, oh, wait, we have uh, Mar Marjorie, you, we haven't heard from you yet. Um, so I'm thinking about uh, Wendy's example of surfing and part of equanimity, ec equanimity for me is also I think about having a prep having a plan that if because yeah I am gonna I'm going to encounter obstacles in my life but kind of planning ahead I just think about you know when they tell you if you get knocked off your surfboard you're supposed to just look up you know look to the sky for your um so you know which way is up you know because it can be very confusing when you're like get knocked off your board and you like start but so i think for me it's having a it's having the plan or knowing mm -hmm. be prepared and staying calm so that if mm -hmm. you if i do start going to one side or another i can bring myself back to center because yeah i'm going to have I, I keep thinking about like, you know, death in my family or, you know, situations that are not optimal and it's tough, but knowing that there's support and I have, I have myself to rely on and just keep it. Yeah. You're going to go off. I, I may go off to one side or another, but just staying calm and bringing myself back. It's been helpful. Yeah. And I think maybe one thing that I'm hearing sort of implicit and what you're saying is some level of confidence that you will be able to bring yourself back. Like this really hard thing is going to happen, you know, but I, I have support and I will be able to weather it. That we'll be able to come back when that yeah. happens. Is and that I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I have that, that awareness of myself. Mm -hmm. As I was just talking about this, you know, like there are so many who don't have that capability. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all, I, I feel very fortunate in that. Musar, studying Musar has helped, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly does. And I was reminded of one of the big lessons I learned is when I was a grief counselor last year, is one of the most helpful things that we would tell people is this will pass. It won't have pass as quickly as you want. It's going to maybe take a really long time, but it will change over time. And that's really helpful to people when they're kind of in the midst of kind of crushing grief is having just a little bit of hope that things will get better. Stephanie. This brought back a situation from my childhood that, that, um, got me in a panic. I went out in the ocean with my father. I um, didn't know how to swim in the ocean. I was very young. 
And uh, he told me when a wave, big wave comes uh, in, just duck under, you know, duck under is what I remember. Well, I panicked and I didn't duck under and I got a whole lot of sand in my mouth and nose and I tumbled and I was terrified. Mm. And I kind of remembered that um, throughout my life, that kind of a situation. So when this quote came up, I, <laughs> I started to think about that time, but I also learned that I've been in a lot of difficult situations in my life. And like Marjorie was saying, I, I kind of have felt like um, uh, getting to know myself in difficult situations, I've managed to get through it somehow. So I just need to remember that, um, that I know I'll be okay. <laughs> I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I suspect we've all had that getting, you know, when I, I like, I wrote that, that mantra, I don't write all of them, but I did write that and getting pounded by the waves. I was thinking about a similar childhood experience for me, except no one told me to duck under. I thought you just kind of muscled, the, you know, muscled your way through and boy that didn't go so well as a little kid on Cape Cod where the waves are pretty strong I got ground in the sand a bunch of times um okay so let's um let's start heading for our getting gearing up for the breakout rooms um maybe we'll look at this one next year but it goes back to this question about calmness and tranquility um this is a quote from Rabbi Israel Salinter, who was the founder of the Musar movement in 19th century Lithuania. As long as one lives a life of calmness and tranquility in the service of God, it is clear that one is remote from true service. So service of God, for you, that might mean service of humanity, service of something bigger for than yourself. Um, but what does Rabbi Salinter mean about service? You know, is it okay to be activated or enthusiastic or, you know, when we're, we're doing things, what is, what's going on here? So I'm gonna stop the share and I will copy this and we'll put it in the chat. Right. Yeah. Can you put me in a room with two other people because I'm driving and I, I, you know, I would rather just listen. You got it. Thank you. Okay. So there is our prompt. Now let me um, get the breakout rooms going. Okay, so the rooms are open. And if you have been um, streaming, this is where we end for the day. So thank you so much for being here. Actor. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think love of God is what motivates people more now. I love but that. That's just what I think. So yeah. that's a great distinction, it. though. Yeah, there was a lot of Ezra Salinter was very. Uh, I have not read his his full book, and I did try to read it and found it a little too tedious. But it was a little. He's a little fire and brimstone. He's a little bit like fear of God and boy, he's better. You know, it's like okay. You know. So that helped me explain what I think that he meant when he wrote what he wrote. Uh-huh. And what do you think he meant? 
I don't think he was coming down on the idea of of calmness and tranquility. What I think he was saying was that in your service of God, you have to be passionate. And I think that's what that phrase, I think that's what that whole thing means, that you have to be passionate in your service to God. And for him, it meant that tranquility and calmness weren't part of passionate. Mm. Oh, interesting. Love that. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that insight with all of us. Thank you. Other thoughts and insights or ways that this maybe relates or doesn't relate to your own life? Yes, Karen. So we talked about the opposite of passion as complacency. Mm. And in the service of God, if we are doing tikkun olam, if we are working to better the world, if we come across issues that we are wrestling with, uh, none of that happens if we're living in a complacent bubble. Mm. And so there are times when being calm and tranquil is good for us. Mm -hmm. But if we're always in that state and taking it to an extreme common coma, I might have said that before, um, mm. we're not motivated, we're not inspired, we're not excited, we're not angered. There's, we don't have a passion to change something for the better in this world. Yeah. And so that was my take. I agree with the find your passion and to the contrary, Let's not just be complacent. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. A lot of good stuff in there. Some really important words, complacency, passion, and I um, can't remember the third one that stood out for me, but it did at the time, and it was a lot of good stuff. Um, Carrie. I imagined um, a world full of zombies. Um. If you weren't mm -hmm. one way or the other just just a boring world where nobody really did anything mm -hmm. and just so you can't you can't be that way and it, it mm -hmm. coincides with everybody else's uh, mm -hmm. comments as well but that was what i saw you know i'm thank you carrie and i'm reading um this fantastic book now it's called the body keeps the score and it's all about how people deal with trauma, uh, trauma kind of shows up in the body. And one of the responses to people who have undergone like a deep trauma or like a car accident or a rape or, you know, PTSD is they do numb out that they just numb all sensations. And it is kind of this ultra calmness where they don't kind of feel passion for things or they have to take extreme risks in order to feel passion because that was the only defense they had against sort of stressful situations so that's very much an extreme of what we're talking about but it's also another you know example of how you know sometimes we have no choice but to shut everything down but you know hopefully none of us are in that that situation but um so that was kind of interesting, interesting just for me and with my history to sort of realize, well, what are some of the circumstances where I might just shut down a little bit and um, finding, you know, and they talk about various ways to deal with that and therapeutic approaches. So highly recommend the book. It's, it's been rated in the top 20 on Amazon for like ages. So it came out about six or seven years ago. So uh Yes, Carrie. Oh, was that an accidental hand raise? Okay. Stacy, I saw you uh, unmuting. I didn't know if that meant you wanted to comment at all. No, I didn't realize that I, I had been unmuted when I left the breakout group. Oh, okay. okay. Not a problem. Any other kind of thoughts or comments about equanimity uh, before we do our closing meditation? Well, since we have a couple of minutes, I'm gonna share one more slide, which we didn't get to earlier, but I really liked it. Um, 
is from Rachel, Rabbi Rachel Barenblatt, who has a website, The Velveteen Rabbi. <laughs> so uh, could someone, I know Joanne, you just joined us, but often you like to read. Would you like to read um, this? If I this can get book? this uh, centered. Okay. I admire the ideal of equanimity of responding to whatever arises from a place of centered acceptance and calm. As long as I do my best to be the kind of person I mean to be, to serve God and my communities in the ways I strive to serve, then that's what matters most. If I focus on my connection with something greater than myself, then I can handle things which seem in my limited understanding to be good or bad with equal grace and presence. Rabbi Rachel Barenblatt, also known as the Velveteen Rabbi. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I thought this was such, um, I, I'm really happy we read it at the end because it seems to encompass a lot of what you have brought today. A lot of the ideas that, um, that kind of we've covered, she sort of summarized very nicely. So with that, um, let's take a moment to close our sacred space for today with a short meditation. So I invite you once again to close your eyes and take in a deep breath through the nose and hold and exhale through the mouth and hold. And then allow yourself to inhale and exhale at your own pace in a calm and leisurely way. Now focus on your feet on the ground and your bottom in your seat. And if you're leaning against something, either a chair or a couch, feel that, that support. Feel that strong grounding, anchoring you where you are. Let this be a metaphor for being supported and grounded by something higher, something greater than yourself. And let you step to that higher place and see with perspective. which can give you the strength and support you need to respond and answer from a place of, of calm. That can give you the grounding to push off with enthusiasm and with passion to approach what needs to be approached. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. Well, friends, thank you so much for being here this week. I look forward to seeing you next Thursday as we explore equanimity for a second week. Thank you. Well thank you. Thank you.